Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio. Today we have a special guest, Mr. Flagdown himself, Pete Griffiths. Pete, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be here. Pete, i got to tell you, you are apparently the number one SP suppressive <laughs> person in all of Ireland and in Clearwater lately. Uh, anyway, let's start by talking about Flagdown. It was a very exciting event. I'm sorry I couldn't attend. I was detained here uh, at, you know, work. So what was going with, what happened at Flagdown? Tell us the whole story. Um, I, I think it was everything that I thought it might be. Um, I'll tell you what was quite interesting, like, as you mentioned that, it sort of went through my mind as to how, how the whole concept came about. And um, it came about because, do you remember how they moved the IES event from St. Hill? This is Clearwater. Yes, I do. Right. Well, they built a giant tent. Exactly. They shipped the tent, the same tent they always use over from England, especially for the event. I believe it came in a number of different containers. Well, we were going to go to, to Clearwater, and we had plans for East Grinstead. And um, whether those plans got out or not, I don't know. But moving to Clearwater took took the IES event out of our backyard, so to speak. So I was a bit frustrated, and I just one day I thought, well, why don't we just go to Clearwater and do something there? So that's how it came about. And I thought, well, if we are going to go to Clearwater, then, you know, a weekend wouldn't really do it justice. Let's go completely mental and have a full week and have a holiday at the same time. And, and that's how that came about. And when we actually got there, it, it kind of went according to plan. We got less hassle than we thought we'd get, which I found quite interesting. Oh, indeed. Yeah, I thought, uh, oh, so what, well, what, what, uh, what was the situation on the ground when you arrived? Uh, you, you weren't, uh, <laughs> it wasn't exactly, I mean, this, it wasn't exactly what I'd led to believe with regards to certain organizational aspects, but I don't really want to get into that. Um, no, no, I, I, just, I just meant you, you weren't uh, greeted by OSA at the airport. No, we weren't, but I was greeted by a process server when I got to the venue. Um, and that in itself was quite interesting because I had no idea who the guy was. I'd never had anything like that happen to me before. Um, this this guy just walked up and said, are you Mr. Griffiths? And I said, yes, I am. And then he, <laughs> he flashed a badge at me and said, I'm a process server. And I, I said, I just like thumbed behind me and said, Get, talk to the sheriff. Because uh, <laughs> we paid uh, Pinellas County Sheriff's Department to, to be our security. So I thought, well, let, let's get them doing something, you know. Um, yeah. So I just ignored the guy and walked straight past him. But John McGee, who was following up behind me, I believe, took the thing just so he could throw it back at the guy. And then it, it fell on the floor. And as far as I know, it stayed there until somebody else came along and picked it up a little bit later. That was, it was kind of interesting because, first of all, we heard that the, that the actual thing was it was a fake injunction, and then we heard that it was a real injunction. But either way, Pinellas County Sheriff's Department were going to investigate because apparently trying to serve a fake injunction is actually a felony, so they'd be interested in that. Did, you, did they ever get to the bottom of it? Um, did... I don't know. Um, I know um, I contacted the person who picked up the fake or real injunction and asked him to contact the sheriff's department so maybe something will come of that maybe it won't i don't know to be honest um process guy showed up again on the friday in the holiday inn and um he was asked to leave by security and he didn't so they called clearwater police department and they asked him to leave which he did so that was quite good Pete, you were, uh, many people may not know, but you were a member of the Church of Scientology for many years. Mm -hmm. And you were actually a mission holder. I was. Um, I was um, a declared SP and a successful mission holder at the same time. <laughs> really? Well, let's, let, let's, yeah. let's leave flag down for a minute. Tell us this part because it's a really fascinating story about how you run a mission as a declared suppressive person. Yeah, well, I mean, t to keep it really simple, um, I received an automatic SP declare because um, I blew the org. Now, I, I, what that actually means, if anyone doesn't know 
the terminology, it means I left without prior and proper permission. And that wasn't for want of trying. If you want to leave staff once you've signed your contract, um, you have to do it properly and you, you do it on a staff leaving routing form, which takes you through a series of steps that allows you to leave in good graces and everyone happy and smiling. Um, strangely enough, when you go on a staff leaving routing form, everyone stops smiling and you become, you take on the color of the enemy. And I noticed this change instantly. Now, the reason I wanted to leave, quite simply, was because my, my ex-wife was kicked off staff. Um, she'd been a psychiatric nurse at some point in her career. And one day, she was the supervisor at the org, and one day she was called in by the, by the uh, secretary who said, we can't have you on staff anymore until psychiatry is abolished. So, so at the stroke, at the stroke of a pen, she was gone. So the two until. of us, yeah. So the two of us were on staff, and suddenly my wife's no, no longer on staff. And I thought, well, okay, things weren't going well. We had a child, and we had another one on the way, and we couldn't put food on the table. We could hardly pay rent. It was terrible. I mean. We'd, we'd go for weeks without pay. It was horrendous. I don't think I've ever been in a worse situation in my life. And yet, I, I hung on in there in the hope that things would get better. But anyway, when she left, I decided to leave. So I went on this staff leaving routing form. And I just wasn't getting through it. You know, I, I did as much as I possibly could. And then I just hit barrier after barrier after barrier. It was almost like... They didn't really want me to leave. Da -da. Well, of course not. You're, <laughs> you know, you're free, free labor. You now, Pete, before the show, we were talking about the the infamous IAS dinner. Mm, yeah, they really went to hell fast. T tell the listeners about how screwed up this thing was. Well, th this is how crazy it got. So, like, I left, I left staff and I got the SP declared, but I still thought that Scientology was this wonderful thing and it, it could help mankind. So I set up a mission and they actually allowed me to operate and run a mission for a few years. Um, and I was actually quite good at it. I got a lot of awards and won the birthday game whilst I declared SP and it didn't bother them and nobody bothered to question it because the SP declare was automatic so it wasn't like I had a, a, a trial or a committee of evidence or anything. Yeah. So whilst like, um, I was actually called in to a meeting and, and the, the commanding officer of the United Kingdom praised me in front of all the Manchester guys saying, why can't you be like this guy and he's a bloody SP? Which, 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 which was really, it was one of, the, one of those moments, you know. This is so wild. Now, you're a declared, or you're, a, you're an SP, right? Mm -hmm. And you're running a mission. And you are so, th you're so theta that the commanding officer praises you, even while acknowledging you're a suppressive yeah. person. Yeah, uh, yeah. And of course, all, all, the, all the Manchester staff guys who were there were sort of wisely nodding their heads and going, yes, we must do better, we must do better. Why can't we be as good as this guy? And there was about six, six people there, you know, and he, he was basically saying that I was better than, than, than all of them put together, which at the time was true. <laughs> it was absolutely true. The mission was okay. doing really well, you know. And because of that, when it came to IAS event time, I'm sure it was the IAS event, I can't rightly remember, but I think it was, um, it was decided that I, I should host the, the event for Manchester Org in my area, which was about maybe 60, 70 miles away. And so I did, and I went to a local hotel, and I booked a room for a couple of hundred people. I, I, I Again, I can't remember the precise numbers. And... To do it with a bit of style, we were going to have a sit-down meal um, provided by the hotel, um, and then we we're going to go and watch the management video like you always do at these things. I'm not sure if the format's changed, but there would be the main event with David Miscavige, and that would be recorded, and then Mark Headley or somebody would like work on the video all week without any sleep, and it would be sent out to all the <laughs> org submissions. Yeah, you, you know how it goes. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and then you show it to your public. Actually, I, I seem to remember, I don't know if it was Mark or what, who said that the, the numbers of people who ever watched those things or who ever tuned in 
when they were alive was about 38,000. But we won't go there anyway. There's millions of Scientologists. So oh, anyway. Billions, yeah. Oh, billions. <laughs> so, like, I, I did this. Now, like, I was a, a bit silly in that I didn't get prepayment from the attendees. So um, that was a big mistake on my part. But, you know, yeah. I, was in, I was in, you know, I, I was constant communication with the executive director of the org about the thing. And I seem to remember him saying, ah, don't worry, it'll be, it'll be okay. People will pay you on the night. And guess what? Yeah. <laughs> Nobody did. Well, I, okay, to be fair, a few people did. But I think I probably collected about 25% of the payments for the meal. Um, and I... I, I I, I might be wrong, but I think they gave us the room because, because we were buying, you know, the dinners. So I was left in a situation there where I had a huge hotel bill to pay for all these dinners that these lovely Scientologists had eaten and enjoyed. How did you enjoy your meal? Lovely. Would you pay me, please? Oh, um, can we give you that next yeah. week? <laughs> 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 and you know what it's like when you lend Scientologists money, right? Oh, Yeah. You know, Pete, this is one of the one of the things that goes on in the church is borrowing money and not paying it back. Oh yeah. I I could do an entire show. In fact, I could do hours and hours and hours of shows about all the 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 money that gets lent between Scientologists. Yeah. And never repaid. Yeah. And to in, in business or personally, and to make it worse, if let's just say that we're two Scientologists, okay? And we're completely theta and, you know, theta most bodies. Most ethical all beings right. on the planet. Don't forget that. And we are the most ethical, upset beings. Now, let's say that you borrow $50,000 from me for your business. And then I get declared SP. <laughs> now, 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 how it really works, are you, do you have to pay me back? Absolutely not. You're an SP. Yeah. It's like the church wants the money anyway. Sure. Why would you pay an SP back? You certainly don't. Uh, uh, like like yourself, I, I've heard so many stories. People have even sold e meters to people, and they didn't. You know, they shipped them, knowing that the most ethical people on the planet would pay, and they never paid. You know, I mean, it, it just goes on and on and on. Um, I've actually witnessed people. Um, you know, you can tell a lot from body language, and I've seen people on the phone begging for money. Um, and getting it and then handing it over to the mission and, and then I spoke like afterwards with the person who lent the money who who gave me their side of the story and it was it was fascinating and that that actual payment never showed up on their accounts for that year so um, hmm. maybe the Irish Revenue Service should be looking at what's going on with the, the figures that they do produce because I know that they're absolutely just completely made up you know but anyway that that's getting off the subject. Yeah, nevertheless. So, so what happened at, at the restaurant? You, well, you yeah, stuck I, I was stuck there with the bill. and um, How much was it? I, I can't remember, but I, but I have a feeling it was around about £2,000 at the time. And, of course, I only collected about 500 or something. Wow. Uh, so I couldn't pay the bill, you know. And um, what, what happened was, of course, all the Scientologists went back to Manchester and wherever it was they came from. Um, I was left with the bill, and it was in my hometown, so there was no escaping that. Um, I'd actually had to really, really sell Scientology to get him to agree to have the thing there, because he didn't want to initially. And I had to keep going back and showing him the way to happiness booklets, you know, the usual crap, PR. And I, I can remember the guy looking at me and nodding slowly and saying, Yes, it seems plausible. <laughs> <laughs> well, the way it worked out, it wasn't plausible. It was far from it. It was quite fraudable, if that's the word. So basically what happened was, like, like because I, I, I really felt betrayed, you know, I did. Because as you can imagine, a week later, all the people who said, oh, I'll, I'll pay you next week and I'll send it on, it never happened. I didn't. Oh, they, get it yeah, happened. they don't even remember your name, Pete. Who? Who? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. oh yeah. Do you, do you remember that thing? Do you, remember, do you remember that? Yeah. Oh yeah. Nice chicken. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Nice dessert. Yeah. So, so I, I was left with the bill anyway, and and because I I really felt that I've been betrayed, which of course I had. Now, okay, to some degree, to some degree, it was my own um, organizational 
mistake not getting the money in the first place. However, I was dealing with the most ethical beings on the planet. You make a good point there. So, and the most ethical beings on the planet stiffed you. I mean... A shot. Yeah. It kind of knocked me sideways. And I it thought, would. well, hang on a second. I mean, if that's what it's going to be like, and obviously, you know, I'd had similar experiences like years before at the org where I'd been betrayed and let down and lied to um, whilst in good standing. Um, so it, it kind of knocked the motivation out of me with regard to running the mission. And I just, I just let things slide. I just stopped doing anything. And, of course, when you stop doing anything, Scientology disappears. I didn't sell any books. I didn't get any new people in. I didn't bother calling people up saying, hey, come and finish your course. Why don't you? you know, I just didn't do anything. And every week when it came to phone in the stats at Thursday, 2 o'clock, I, well, for the first couple of weeks, I phoned up and said, look, I'm really sorry, but there's nothing to report this week. And it was like, well, nothing, nothing. I went, no, nothing. And then uh, as the weeks went on, they would phone me and say, anything to report? And I'd say, nope, not this week. And that went on for six weeks before they actually came up and told me that the mission was taken off me. And it was my job to transport everything to the new mission holder who was in a town 30 miles away, which I did at my own expense. Um, and I gave them the treasury file as well, which had the bill for the hotel in it. Oh, the restaurant bill in it. Yeah, because if the mission, you know, it was no longer mine. <laughs> um, th th there was a, a mighty sense of relief that it that it was gone and it was over. But even having said that, would you believe that in the back of my mind? One day I was going to get back into Scientology and, and make it all go right and do the, do the steps you need to do and all the rest of it. Um, I suppose it well, saved them the job of declaring me, as it was already declared. I suppose that was uh, saved a bit of time. No, I would believe that. I, I know people who, uh, I think unconsciously at some level, they get themselves out of Scientology one way or another because it is so dreadful. And, and they tell themselves, you know, I'll do A to E, I'll go back someday. Yeah, that's but, exactly you know, what that, I did. Exactly. That's part, yeah, that's part of the, the cognitive dissonance. You don't totally. really, it, it's so hard to confront what you've been involved with, how you've been treated. You don't, and you don't confront it. You certainly don't confront it. Um, uh, th there are these fantastic pat phrases like, look, don't listen. That's probably one of the most sensible pieces of advice you could ever get. And that's, that's one of Hubbard's advices. But they don't actually do that, you know? I mean... Uh, oh, no, no. What's, what we were uh, discussing before the show, Pete, this is an interesting point. Mm. The, 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 the things in the church, you know, confront... What, were, what was your list? Confronting things, uh, looking... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, mm. Well, I mean, here's, here's a good example. Like, yeah. like, you're familiar with the PTSSP doctrine, which simply says, in, in capital letters, he always resorts to caps, doesn't he, Ron, when he wants to make a point. But anyway, shouting. like, um, uh, any and all foul-ups stem only from a PTS condition. I don't know if you can... If you <laughs> yeah, I that. remember reading that. So, yeah. Right, so you read that and you go, what? Any and all foul-ups. That means just... Anything that ever goes wrong is because you're PTS. But that's a very hard pill to swallow if it's true. But um, another thing I mentioned about was I think it was the Penn and Teller thing where they were talking about how they get away with their tricks. And they, and they said that um, you don't tell people what to think. You just show them something and let them come to their own wrong conclusion. And I thought, aha. Scientology in a nutshell. So you don't tell people what to think. You just give them information and then they, they do it themselves. So you read the PTSP thing about how any and all foul-ups stem from a PTS condition and you go, well, that can't possibly be true. <laughs> oh, come on. And then as time goes on, you go, well, maybe it is. And you do reach your own wrong conclusion. And that's just one thing. Look, don't listen is another one because Scientologists certainly do not 
do that. You know, they listen to what Miscavige says. They don't look at the stats because they don't know what the stats are. They can't get access to the stats. So, oh, and this is very interesting. Uh, people still in the church can be some of the most obnoxious, no bests in the world. Oh God, yeah. And I, I remember dealing with Scientologists in the church. In, in business, you know, I had some Scientology clients here in L.A., and in the course of business, they would say something like, Jeff, you're wrong. <laughs> I go, why? Well, look, I, I've done the data evaluator series. I've done the data series. And I, I would shake my head like, oh, that means you're omniscient. <laughs> it's like, I've done, the, I've done the data series. You haven't. Well, no, I didn't want to, but that was beside the point. And they would say, you, you know, you're not looking. You're just not looking at this. You're thinking. It's think, 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 figure, figure. Yeah, yeah. And like, my, I'm in a, you know, I'm in the, I, my job, I worked in science. I'm not, a, I'm not a PhD scientist, but I'm certainly very technical. And I had to work around a lot of science and physics and know what the hell I was doing. Yeah. And I, I would have people tell me I'm engaging in think, think, figure, figure. Well, I got paid to do that. Yeah. Whatever they're, whatever they're doing, looking at something, I, I just didn't track with them as they would say. Yeah, I mean, there again, that is Scientology in a nutshell. And you've only got to look at the different statuses that exist. For example, I mean, I don't want to re knock the tech because. Oh, know, no, no, I'm, um, I'm not. I'm just. But let's just talk about the state of clear. Um, yeah. We all know what, it's, what it says and what it's meant to be. And then you meet clears and you look at them and go, well, hang on a minute. Well, number one, why they're wearing glasses and, and, and why why they're making stupid mistakes and why they got no money and you know and you, you're looking but you're listening oh well you know and i even i even heard it said ah well they're not really clear and then it's like oh so and then it goes to another level when you start to meet ot's you think, well hang on i thought so t's were like superficials and all this and why is that person stammering or or, or whatever you know and again it, it, what you're told does not match up with what you're actually looking at and the reality of the thing. So, as, as you say, like the cognitive dissonance is there, but it's too painful to actually confront reality. And I don't mean the Scientology definition of reality. I mean the real definition. You know. Yeah, yeah. Everyday life, if you want to say that. But you know, Pete, I have never had problems with the Scientology technology. I think people who want to uh, practice the tech should do all the Scientology they want. Totally. Let them out. And, and, and I, I'm like Tony Ortega and so many others. I don't, my argument's not with practicing Scientology. Get all the auditing, knock yourself out. It's more the human rights abuses, the criminality of the church. For me, it's now, only that. It's only the abuses yeah. and it's only uh, wrongful deaths. Um, the, the, the fact that, um, I mean, I met somebody at Flag Down who has suffered terribly in that a family member lost their life. And, okay, to lose your life is, is a terrible, tragic thing. But this person has to live this every day. So as, as well as having their life destroyed, it's destroyed every day. It, it's constant and it's going on. And Scientology doesn't care. Um, for a religion that doesn't care about anybody, I, I, find, I find that very difficult, you know. Um, I don't really want to get into, the, like, is it a religion, is it not a religion? Because, you know, I don't think that's going to benefit us. But it isn't, it isn't so much the tech itself as, as what people do with the beliefs that becomes a problem and wh how, how far people are willing to go. Because another one of these phrases is, of course, the greatest good for the greatest number of dynamics, which always comes out in favor of Scientology, of course. Yeah, you, you, uh, exactly. It's always in favor of the group. And what is uh, uh, so difficult for, for people to understand who, who have never been in the Church of Scientology is it's so surreal. It, it literally warps reality. And I remember meeting an OT, you know, like 1982, I think, an OT7. And there was this aura about an OT7. Because back then I wondered, I didn't know what I know now, and I wondered, well, they, do they have really mental telepathy? Can they make people on another? Like one of the tests back then was 
someone distant will mail you a letter. Mm. And, and, you know, can they do remote viewing? Can they leave the body? And I remember I had an OT, uh, a client of mine named Gunter, and he wore glasses and he smoked cigarettes. And he insinuated to me that he had these powers, but he really couldn't talk about them. Yeah. And I got to tell you, I went back to my – I did a lot of work, Pete, to leave the Pentecostal church. It was a prison in my own mind, mm. you know, and it was kind of culty, frankly. Uh, my particular part of Pentecostalism. So I was, once I got out of that, I vowed to never go back into captivity. Yeah. So when this guy, Gunner's telling me, kind of inferring that he has miraculous powers, I'm not buying it. And I asked him, I said, why do you smoke? <laughs> smoke? He goes, he, I remember him inhaling and saying, smoking won't hurt the body. Uh, right. Okay. <laughs> and, and I think then I really had like an insight into, yeah, because I had seen in college in, in biology, I had seen lab slides of cancer and tissues and cells. And he's telling me smoking won't, won't hurt the body and that st uh, structure senior to function or whatever, you know, that thing. And then the other thing this OT told me, and this is such gobbledygook, is What's true for you is true for you. Oh God, yeah, that 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 is that is the classic one, and and going back to allowing people to make the wrong conclusion, that specific one lets people make the wrong conclusion constantly. But uh, what does it even mean? I don't. I have what no is, idea. You tell me what, what what does it mean if if it's real? Well, you, you were in the, real. You know. You mean what you own a mission? I I don't know what's true for you is true for you. Well, you could be wrong. Well, I mean, I mean, I think we mentioned earlier. You know, if if you stand in a pit full of rattlesnakes, are they not going to bite you? You know, what what's going to happen there? What's real with regard to rattlesnakes? Yeah, yeah, and and that's one of the, uh, you know, in terms of of morphing everyday reality. The other thing that goes on in Scientology is the use of language. Totally, and totally, totally. At the at the very outset, look. There's an, an old model of religion. R religion's built on a, a paradigm called spirit and matter. Mm. And really, it, it, it's a model. It's a conceptual model. And I, I talk about it in my book. But spirit and matter is a paradigm where you have an invisible spiritual being and you ha inhabit a temporal body. It's in Hinduism, Christianity, Islam. Every religion is built on this premise, this, con this concept. And you can think with the data, to use a Scientology term. You can, you know, you can kind of get your mind around that, right? Yeah. And Hubbard changed it to theta mest. It's the That's same all. concept, though, you know. It's the, it's the same thing, but he, he, you know, when the use of language, you know, when you, when, and one thing I have to do on this show is ask people to explain terms because someone will say, well, I was at Int Base and COCMO Gold came in. I went, wait, <laughs> Stop. You got to like say the commanding officer. Of, yeah. You know, it's too easy to get into jargon. And, and I think there's, there's been a lot of um, videos. I think Karen actually made a video about um, about Scientology as it's sometimes known. But um, one thing I do, sorry. one thing I, I encourage people to do when they leave the church is to use use normal everyday language to stop using the jargon. Totally. Yeah. How hard when when you left the church? How hard was it for you to use regular language? Um, it was very difficult. Um, like as I say, I was I was actually kicked out in 1994, but I maintained the mindset for a further 14 years until I actually began to investigate for myself. And like I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm going to say I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say like even though people are free to believe what they like and if and if they think that they're getting benefits from the tech, they they're quite free to do it. But in my opinion, they are deluding themselves to some degree, and language is one of the ways in which they do it. I mean, let, let's let, let let's redefine reality. Woo! If you can do that. You think about it. I mean, the only thing worth worth having in life is reality. So if you redefine what reality means, you're redefining life for so many people. And that's, that's what Scientology is. And it's done innocuously on that very first course when you learn about the ARC triangle. Affinity, reality, communication. Well, I know what those words mean. Oh, no, you don't. 
Here's the Scientology Dictionary. Discover what those words really mean. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, it, it, it's, I don't know. I don't know. I, I used to think that Scientology wants to take over the world. And I, I think to some degree they do. But they don't want to do it um, in, in the same way as maybe the Russians want to take over the world or, or whoever, empire builders. They do it by creating a sort of parallel world that would then encompass the real world. And God help us all if they ever do take over. You know, you know that's, that is so true. The, the root of Scientology is world domination. Mm. And that, that's true of the major monotheistic systems. Christianity and Islam both want world domination. And, they're, and you, you said it correctly. They have a reality replacement system. True. So it would be a, a self-referential tautology. Yeah. We're the law because we say we are the law. You said and, that. That's, you said it. That's it. Yep. Well, yeah. This and and within this reality replacement system, and this is where it gets very pernicious. Are there usable things in Scientology technology? Sure. No problem. You know, auditing. I, I don't. I don't have any qualms with there is some workability in it. I know enough people who've told me that I believe them. I have no reason to doubt them. Some of them are very successful and wealthy. And, okay, it's fine. Let's just, for the sake of argument, concede, okay, there's some useful stuff in it. Now, does that translate to that it's a universal, all-encompassing thing that can rule the world? No. No, because Scientology doesn't work for everybody. I know people for who it didn't work. I know people it harmed. Yeah. But, but when you look at a member in the church, the very things that they're preaching about, you know, look, don't think, you know, all, what's true for you is true for you. They seem to turn off all their critical faculties. That's exactly what happens. I, I think um, Steve Hassan calls them um, thought-stopping phrases because they do stop thought. You're not, you, know, you can't go beyond that phrase, and the phrase explains, it, explains everything away. So. Well, they turn off critical, their critical faculties, totally. especially with respect to the Church of Scientology itself. Yeah. What was the, well, what was the big crack in the Truman Show for you? What was the first time? Did you, was it going online? Yeah. Um, for me, it was definitely February 2008. I, I was kind of on the internet, but I wasn't looking at anything Scientology related. Um, the whole subject was in a compartment in my mind to be opened later. Yeah. Hmm. And um, I became aware of the protests because I knew somebody who was going. And my response was quite simply, why are you protesting about those guys? They're the good guys. They are the things I just mentioned. Getting people off drugs, rehabilitating criminals, the experts on the mind. They really know about the mind, not like psychiatry. And I was just looked at as though I was crazy and, and just told, oh, them, God, yeah. why don't you just go and do a bit of research online? And I went, okay, I'm not afraid of that. Yeah, it's been some years since I've been involved in them and, and they can't touch me now. So I'll do a little bit of research online. And oh my God, my life changed. <laughs> my life completely <laughs> changed utterly. I, I, I sometimes talk to an OT. Um, OT5, I think he's reached now. He's, he's really shooting up the bridge these days. He's done the student hat again for about, about the sixth time. And this is the best time ever. Whoa, okay, that's another story. But um, we were talking one day, and I actually got him to admit that he'd seen some things that were wrong within the Church of Scientology as it exists today. And I thought, oh, this is great, we're making some progress here. So I asked him, why don't you do something about it? And he just looked at me like I was mad and said, I won't do that because you tell me to. <laughs> <laughs> So, so again, again, we've got that whole thing going on. I'm going to have to use the word deluded. I mean, it, it, I think it's a harsh word to use. But it, it's, well, this, it, is talk, this is talk radio. You're free to use whatever <laughs> word you want. We're, we're basically, look, Pete, I am not, uh, one thing, one reason I do this, I don't have a sponsor. I don't mm. want one. I do this for free. Right. And so this is nice cause, because I'm not under the constraints of time. Excellent. And this is internet-based, so you can see whatever you want. Now, I may not agree with you, 
But so what? This is talk radio. But, but it's, not, it's not wonderful to have people with diverse opinions and, and, and different ideas. Oh, it's ideas. great. I'm, I'm changing my mind all the time, you know. I mean, last week I was a bloody idiot, but I'm, I'm perfect. This week I know, I know everything there is to know about everything. But last week, if you'd asked me, I was a complete idiot last week. No. I've, learned, I've learned so much oh, this boy. week, you know. That's just the way I, have, I operate. Yeah, no kidding. I've got to tell you, uh, you know, I thought I knew uh, all about Scientology, right? And then, but the more I study it, as, you know, as a researcher, a, a writer, the more I study it, it's always uh, amazing, one, how big it is. There, you know, mm-hmm. Hubbard did a, lot of, did a lot of writing. There's the red and green volumes. And I think what's fascinating to me about Scientology are all the nuances. Yeah. All the, all the, um, all the little rules, like everything from the famous example is uh, Hubbard wrote a bulletin on how to wash windows using newspaper. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and Mark yeah. Headley's been on the show talking about how you're locked into using telexes. Of course, of course. And, and, and in, back in the day, it was the Mimeo, <laughs> you know, the Mimeograph. Uh, yeah, and even to hear that word brings back the smell of uh, mimeograph <laughs> fluid, which you know I used in school eight million years mm. ago. But um, but when you study Scientology in detail, there's things like a black five case. It, it, it's fascinating. And, it, it, and and then of course I'm married to the world expert on Scientology. Of course you are. <laughs> the class twelve case supervisor. So I have Karen can explain things at a phenomenal level. Mm about the subject, but seeing it in operation, watching it over time, uh, it has no, the Church of Scientology has no capacity for self-correction, no capacity to evolve, to change, grow, or adapt, and that's what's crippling it, Pete. Yeah, um, let me ask you something, like like if I say that, that, that Scientology is a complete system, in that he's got all the bases covered. Would you agree with that? Uh, n- no, I wouldn't, uh, because at a high level, uh, philosophically, I see it as a tautological system that fails to have any self-correcting mechanism. Right. It's, fu- it's fundamentally self-destructive, and I'll tell you why I think that. The engine that drives Scientology mercilessly, that's got it, it's $1.5 billion plus, the little engine that drives Scientology is a tyrant. It's called Thursday at 2 p.m. Mm. And this greed for money every week, Thursday at 2 p.m. for production or you get punishments, in my opinion, that is the system. Everything else is an armature or a superstructure erected upon greed. Now, my point is that when you, you, when you say, is it, a, is it a system unto itself? My answer is no. I don't right. think it is. But when you're inside, I can see how it's all encompassing. No, I, I, have... I do agree. I do agree. Yeah. One of the big bug bursts for me is something that they call the conditions formulas and, and the conditions themselves, which are supposed to be uh, the, the way it works, the way things work. I actually don't believe that that's correct because I, I think the conditions themselves have a sort of inbuilt destruct mechanism simply because there is a limit to what you can do. You cannot produce more and more each week. It's impossible. You will reach a peak, your best ever. Once you've reached your best ever, where do you go from there? Well, I suppose, like uh, a purist will say, ah, well, you're in a condition of power then. You, You have to move to power change. But if you're producing on the same post week in, week out, and it's like, say, book sales, and the most you can ever do in a week is 100, then you're never going to be able to get your stats up. No, and that's the problem with when, when you have to increase forever. You're just not going to. Even, right. even mighty corporations plateau. Exactly. And that's, yeah. Yeah, that's why they diversify and have to go into other businesses to find growth. Even the mighty Google, and I like Google a lot. Karen and I own plenty of Google stock. We love it. But even Google realizes that its growth in advertising will plateau. It'll, it'll absorb some finite market share. So that's why it's going into robotics, all kinds of other fields that are interesting. And the idea in Scientology that there's infinite growth presupposes uh, an infinite demand for Scientology, which doesn't exist. Because 
really how many people, one, have an interest in the subject, two, have the million dollars you need to go to the top of the bridge, yeah. three, care to live in that kind of authoritarian hell, uh, right. and four, give their children to the Sea Org. Well, uh, I mean, yeah. you, got, you have to be – this is why uh, experts call it a high-demand cult. Mm. You know, religious people who study it call, it, call Scientology, it's characterized as a high-demand cult. And the word cult is interesting because I've had journalists ask me, is this a business or is it a religion? And I said, wait a, wait a minute, there's an intermediate word called cult that fits Scientology. Yeah. It's built around a cult of personality. First, you know, it's L. Ron Hubbard, then, and now it's David Miscavige very much. So it fits the psychodynamics of a cult, but when you're inside the church, that, those words hurt because you don't want to come up to the realization that you are in that kind of cultic system. But if you don't have the freedom to speak, think, and act as you want freely, then, then you have to really do a pretty radical reappraisal to see what your actual condition is relative to the, the true state of freedom. Yeah. Um, you're only assessing wh – wh when you're in, you're only assessing where you are using the tools that they've given you to assess. So, so you're not, you're not um, allowed, really, to, to go outside the bubble or, or, or to think outside the box. Um, really clever people are derided. Um, I, I know our local people, um, like we have an um, institution here called Trinity College, which is like one of the uh, foremost universities in the world. And our local Scientologists just, just mock constantly Trinity College and the things that they do. Oh, well, they discover a cure for certain types of leukemia. Oh, <laughs> if they only knew what really causes leukemia. You know, this, that's the, <laughs> yeah, that. but that's the mindset that you're up against. You've got people who feel superior to everybody else on planet Earth, and, and that's absolutely true. They do, because I did. That, it happened to me in one weekend, would you believe? Um, I went back to work on the Monday from doing the comm course, and I knew I was superior to them because I could now communicate. So... <laughs> But no, you, th this whole this the the, the uh, L. Ron Hubbard was anti-intellectual, mm. and oh, yeah. there's, of, there, there's often a lot of really good uh, comments on uh, Tony's blog. Hubbard loved to tell these stories where he put you know expert PhDs in their place. Yeah, 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 yeah. And but but yeah. but but anyway, that's just one of Hubbard's characteristics. But the larger anti-intellectualism, anti-science, anti-body, anti-sex, anti-everything in the Church of Scientology. It does – What it, one thing it does give a person is a sense of elitism. It does. And, it does. And, but that, that elitism is often unearned, unmerited, and so that's why they could scoff at Trinity College or UCLA or anything else and think, oh, if you really knew. And what it's – what, in, in a practical uh, expression, my experience of, of people in the church is that they're spiritual snobs, uh, and, and they think Absolutely. that – you know. This whole idea in Scientology uh, that uh, Hubbard once said that, you know, Jesus was a clear, um, Buddha was a clear. It's like, well, how big of you, Mr. Hubbard? It's so insulting and abusive to other faith traditions to think, you know, we show up. We, and that's one reason I, in, in my blog, OT is great, I use the we in RTC, uh -huh. because I'm, I'm uh, satirizing that spiritual snobbery. Yes. That vacuous spiritual snobbery. And Tom Cruise so perfectly embodied it in that leaked video where he said, we are the experts. We're the authorities on the mind on getting people off drugs, as you mentioned earlier. Yeah. And I think that video was so – I think it went viral because it showed what a Scientologist really looks like. They do think they're the experts. I was That's that guy. I was that guy. I said exactly those same things. you know, And I, I, no one told me to. But it was just what I'd taken on board. It was just um, how I would sell Scientology to people. We are the experts on the mind. No one realizes it, of course, but we know. <laughs> yeah. So, it, so it really plays to the ego. It does. Does it make? It does. does it turn? Does it make? Does science? And one one of my friends said that Scientology creates super egos. Do you think that's true? Ugh. Totally. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Um, do you know another thing? Another, the whole thing about the auditing thing, like, like if people feel they need auditing and they want to get auditing that makes them feel better, then great, let them, let them, let them away. Um, but like a Scientologist would always mock psychoanalysis and psychiatry as not having any real technology, and yet, like, to be spending hours in the auditing chair analyzing yourself. I mean, do you really have that many problems that you need to do all this? Um, I, 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 I suppose you do. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just quite possibly, but I've always looked at uh, in, in one sense. This is just one sense, and it's only my experience. It's not a universal. I, this is just my opinion, and I'm careful to preface it in hopes that Scientologists still in the church are listening. To me, some part of auditing is an intense inspection of one's own subjectivity. Right now. That can be very beneficial, and it also describes the psychoanalytic experience. Psychoanalysis is the intense inspection of one's own subjectivity with a view toward resolving the problems that arise from one's own subjectivity. Yeah. Okay, now, one thing Hubbard said in uh, the Red Volume Book 1 in 1950 is that dianetics was psychoanalysis uh, plus the e-meter. Right. And to me, that's very revealing and is not talked about anywhere, but it's there. It's there in the book. And so I think I think there's a psychoanalytic benefit within auditing. Now, can you become so obsessed with the, your own interiority, your own subjectivity, that you become crippled and, and bound to an organization? Yes. Yes. Because... Yes, because you, you, publics can get to the point where they can't do anything without going into session over it. So true. And I, in, in the past, I've known Scientologists, it's like, I've got to go get a session. I'm thinking, <laughs> yeah, yeah, why, yeah. Well, yeah. why don't you just handle it? Yeah. I mean, why do, you, why do you need to go pay some money? Why can't you just handle it? It's not that big. Of, no, I've got to get a session. Yeah. So, okay, fine. But I, I couldn't understand this auditor dependency. Like, when do you spiritually mature? If you're an OT... Why would you? It doesn't. Why would you need chronic sessions if you're OT? See that exactly, exactly. It, 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 that that one has always always got me. So to me, I think I know people who've gotten a great deal of benefit in Scientology. For example, I interviewed Guy Racine, OT8, of course, yeah. and Guy is very articulate, very smart, and he got benefit out of it. I take him at his word. And so I think I think people who get benefit out of Scientology, for me, the EP, the real EP of Scientology is that you will leave the organization as an act of your own self-determinism and integrity. You will leave because yeah. you cannot be spiritually enlightened and empower that kind of organization and that kind of human suffering. They're incompatible. I think looking over what you said there, that the almost the entirety of Scientology is actually about control, about controlling people uh, and getting people to do what you want them to do. And I don't think spiritual freedom really has you being controlled by anybody other than yourself. So, so oh, well uh, said. Yeah. Well said. We are. I, I think that's a perfect summation coming up on our hour that it is very much about control. And when a person is through being controlled, abused, lied to, used, that they will leave because they don't need to be controlled anymore, nor would they want to. Yeah. I mean, it, it's only looking back how I see that it's done that way. But, uh, of, of course, it was set up. Scientology works as it was intended. That's another thing I heard recently, which I thought, ah, I like that. And... The, the intention of Scientology is to control people. It's to get you on board. It's to make you a, a willing Scientologist. And uh, I am in no way decrying people who, who um, think they've found something wonderful in Scientology and they're getting benefits from it because good luck to them. I mean, I, I really hope they continue and I hope they really make wonderful medical discoveries and, and, and save the world and help homeless people. Of course, I know they won't. Pete, what would you say to people still in the Church of Scientology? Oh, 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 oh. oh I, I would actually get on my knees before them and say, please, please, just, just, just look. Don't listen. You know, um, look, look. Okay, here's an organisation that claims to make people totally free, uh, and yet, and yet, money. Okay, why all the emphasis on money? 
just just compare the stated aims of Scientology and the aims of each individual Scientologist and, and equate that with all the money side of things. Like, I, I think one of the very first things I ever said, you know something, this is so good, we should be giving it away for free. Oh, well, we can't do that because, uh, <laughs> you know. Yeah. I mean, and, and I even, like, um, I, I remembered something quite recently uh, um, about something that happened years ago in the org when I'm rooting through a whole load of old stuff and I came across this huge box. It was a massive box of Way to Happiness bundles. They were all in bundles of 12. And I'm thinking, you know, we've got this terrible reputation with the public and here's this Way to Happiness booklet and if we were to just hand them out and people read them, they'd see that we're not really all bad and that we've got good motives and all the rest of it. And I suggested, why, why don't we just hand these out? And I was told, no, 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 no. We're to sell those to public and they're supposed to hand them out. I went, oh, okay. And that box never moved. You know, that box stayed exactly where it was because someone didn't buy the booklets. Um, yeah, because that would be, in Scientology's doctrine, that would be out exchange to give them Yeah, them. see, but there's, there's another thing. There's another thing. There's an answer to everything. And when you get into Scientology and you get further and further into the trap, all of these things just further entrap you. Um, like I, I studied the OEC and I almost finished the FEBC, so I'd you know, be, be fairly admin trained. Um, but, but things like, like when, when you discover the conditions by exchange and exchange by dynamics and, and things like that, you feel like you've gone to another level of enlightenment. In actual fact, you've gone to another level of entrapment. And that's, that's the sad thing. What would I say to people who are still in? I, I, I would beg them just to be true to themselves and not listen to what they're being told. Just, just a quick kind of a, another anecdotal thing. Um, again, yes, I, I, I was talking to um, um, a Scientologist here and I was, I, I, was, I, was, I was saying, Michael, 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 they're lying to you. They're lying to you. And he said, no, no, they're not, they're not. And I said, well, well, well hang on a minute. Like, like, what I'm seeing and what you're seeing are two different things. Which one of us is seeing the truth and where are you getting your information from? And he said, I'm getting my information from the events. That's how I know that Scientology is expanding. And I said, but how can you say that? How can you, you say that's factual? Because they say it at the events. It must be true. And wow. I'm exasperated with that because... That's not proof. That's not proof of anything, you know? No, it's not. But again, once you have given over your power to an organization and you uncritically take its statements to be true, mm. don't be shocked if someone calls you a cult member. <laughs> yeah. Go because I will Go tell on. you, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I will yeah. tell you out <laughs> here, out here in the WOG world, we are critical. We inspect, we check, we debate. You know, yeah. I mean, it's ruthless out here only because, you know, we do our due diligence. Sure. This is why there are very, this is why there's safe cars, safe medicine, safe food. You have a lot of really hard ass people inspecting things, enforcing the law, punishing the cheaters. Yeah. And we're not uncritically accepting whatever the president or the senator or an authority figure says. We don't blindly trust anyone. To me, when I when I uh, take up a new venture, I look very hard, and that's part of my my hard corporate training, looking very critically. Is this a good investment? Can I trust these people? And you know, that's part of uh, of, of adult life. You That's have right, to protect yeah. yourself. But what do you base that on? You base it on facts, right? Yeah, fact. And, yeah. and there's also intuition, a feeling, examination. Okay, so you go on those things as well. Do you go yeah. on, do you, do you use this one in your um, assessment? Well, I am dealing with the most ethical beings on the planet, so I'm going to be safe with this investment. Because that, that, that one we've mentioned a few times, but that one is a thought stopper. If you, if you believe that you're dealing with the most ethical beings on the planet, then you're going to trust them implicitly with just about everything, including your money, your life, your health, your, you know, you name it. And that's the problem. That's the entrapment right there. It's, it's control. You know, it's all control. Oh, it is. It is. And out, uh, again, out in the WOG world, what we would do is, uh, 
in corporate life is use a contract. And I'll leave it at this. In the 1980s, regarding uh, relations with uh, the Soviet Union, President Reagan said, trust but verify. Mm. So, he, you know, they wanted us to shake hands but uncritically accept their word on missiles. <laughs> okay. And Reagan's term was, no, I want to send inspectors into your facilities to actually look. So, yes, I'll trust you as long as I can verify. And I think that's the missing thing in the Church of Scientology. They ask you to trust them on everything. When you ask to verify anything, you might be sent to ethics or declared. That's, that's perfect. That's absolutely perfect. Because yeah. they don't encourage that. They, no. you, you are basically expected just to accept because you are dealing with the most ethical beings on the planet. And, of course, you're just a wog or a, or a newly, a newly uh, a new PC or, or just a, a, a released <laughs> wog. You're not clear. You're not clear. Um, yep. Pete, we'll, we'll leave it at that because I, I want to have you on the show again. We've got to pick this up. But, yeah, we'll leave it at that. We're not clear. Well, I hope and, we did the subject justice. No, we didn't. We need more radio shows. We didn't even barely discuss flag down. So we've got a whole bunch of people who were there who are listening, who are watching online, wanting to hear more about flag down. And uh, because we're guys like we are, we got off on a whole bunch of other stuff. But for first time guests, you're great, and I want you back immediately. Well, thanks, Jeff. That means part a lot. Two, part three. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, you have a, a very good insight into the church, and I really appreciate you being on the show and sharing your heart with the audience. And we'll we'll pick it up in the next section. So, for Surviving Scientology Radio, this is your host Jeffrey Augustine saying thank you for listening, and as always, we'll be in very good touch. <laughs>